A very good afternoon to all of you and uh, thank you for joining us for this special webinar today. I'm Preeti Manotra and I lead the well-being practice at Great Place to Work. Of course, I uh, have interacted with uh, many of you. Uh, for the people who have uh, regularly joined us in our webinar series and the learning events, would know that uh, when we started our well-being practice, uh, our vision is to really make India a healthy place to work for all. And we have been running a series of these webinars. The objective really is to bring to you learning from subject matter experts and corporate leaders so that we can all go back and apply something in our personal lives and in our organizations. So today we have a very special session design and this is a prelude to the World Cancer Day tomorrow. Uh, we, I think the more we study or learn about this subject, we realize that there is, while there is a huge role that the medical team and the governments play in building the infrastructure, making, uh, you know, cancer care accessible, affordable, all of those are aspects that we look at, but there is so much more that each of us as individuals can do. And uh, today, unfortunately, cancer is not something which uh, you know, uh, is is very rarely present or things like that. If you look at the statistics, it's only worsened over the years. And I think all the more uh, the need for each of us to know more, uh, both in terms of awareness, prevention, all of that. And I think the data tells us that uh, we should uh, definitely educate ourselves as to more about what we can do and how can we have the right information both on awareness and prevention. And that was our reason at Great Place to work to really have this session today. And we're really delighted to have Dr. Saurav Radhakrishnan with us. Uh, welcome, doctor. And he is the director of the medical team at Karkinos Healthcare. Of course, his expertise is medical oncology and precision medicine. And of course, uh, this is not where he spends most of his time, right? He's, he's kind of uh, very passionately working with patients, caregivers to really make a difference in this space, has over 15 years of experience in the field, uh, has also worked in pediatric uh, oncology and stem cell transplant. He has worked both at Tata Memorial Center and Ames before joining Karkinos and uh, we're really delighted that he's taken this time out today to share his experience and learning with all of us. Uh, so welcome doctor once again and uh, before we uh, sort of get into the session, uh, I'll just kind of inform the our audience about how the structure is. So we'll, we'll just open, uh, have an introduction and then we will have uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan share uh, general information about cancer, what each of us can do. And we also have a dedicated time for Q&A at the end. Uh, some of you have also shared your questions while you registered. So we've taken a note of those and we will leave those in. Feel free to keep typing in your questions. But like I said, we will have a dedicated time for Q&A at the end as well. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan, uh, are you able to hear me? We've, uh, we've yes. sent you a video. You can hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, then uh, shall I uh, share the screen? Yes, yes. Just before you uh, go on to that, doctor, I just wanted to ask that, of course, you've been working in the field uh, and uh, not many of us know about Karkinos. When I first came to know, I was very, very, uh, you know, inspired, intrigued to know more and just wanted to know how did your journey begin at Karkinos and why did you really, uh, <laughs> what sort of inspired you? to uh, come in and join this team to drive this uh, movement uh, that the organization is on? So that is a very interesting question. Actually, <clears throat> after I uh, was came out of Tata and uh, also, as you said, in uh, Ames, Delhi, I worked in a, a medical college as a medical oncologist and we were having, I was there for a long period. I worked in a corporate center initially, then to a medical college for a long time I was there. So in around 2021, and uh, Venkat Raman, Mr. Venkat Raman, who's our CEO, he is the he was the uh, one of the um, uh, director and board of Tata Trust, and later on with Reliance also. And he and Dr. Mooney, who's a very senior head and neck oncosurgeon uh, in India and in the US, 
uh, at the time, Dr. Modi had just stepped down as director of Cochin Cancer Center, and uh, that is part of the government. And he had come to with this idea of having a cancer center which is without any walls. So we have a concept of office without walls, so why not a cancer center without walls? Instead of having specific centers, so, uh, Venkat has a approximate uh, experience in setting up around 30 cancer centers all over India when he was in uh, this. Most of the centers that we see around in Calcutta or in Varanasi and all of all Assam and all those places where he had headed those uh, projects along with the engineers and others. Okay. So he has a good uh, knowledge of oncology also, although uh, he's a PhD doctor, but not a medical, but he has a very good knowledge of uh, this thing. So Dr. Moni and Dr. Uh, and was Dr. Ram Das, whom I knew from a long time. He was additional director at Regional Cancer Center in Trivandrum. So they both uh, talked to me and convinced me to <laughs> leave in my comfort zone, which I was there at that time. Initially, I'll be very frank with you. When uh, we I had discussions with Venkat, he I, I didn't understand the concept. You know, I kept on asking him, "How will you work and where will I sit?" So he said, "You'll sit wherever you want." <laughs> so I couldn't get that thing around my head. How can I sit somewhere and I mean wherever I want and treat a patient? Then, over a period of time, I understood the concepts and how it has come about. We have specific physical centers. As I told you yesterday, I'm sitting in Imphal today, where yeah. we have a German center. With the government coming up here, uh, it's the first center for the government in for cancer care in Imphal, in Manipur actually, in, in this part of Northeast, I would say, other than Assam. So uh, it has taken some time, but uh, we have slowly reached to a place where our own center, we have partner centers already, and our own centers in India are more or less in another two months are on stream in multiple locations. We are also outside. We also have a global advisory board who, uh, guides us, you know, in the sense that these are mainly oncologists who are in the major institutes, mostly Harvard, Stanford, or uh, Mayo Clinic. Oh, and so Incidentally, Mayo is also one of our persons who's, uh, the clinic is one of the uh, organizations which is backing up both from a financial and is also on our board of directors in supporting this uh, venture with us. We now, uh, we keep on saying we are a startup, but as somebody pointed out, and around two weeks back, you know, we are close to 500 employees and like more than one and a half years. So we are uh, no longer a inverted comma startup now. <laughs> we are an established kind of a place and we are going forward. We had multiple reviews from the global advice and they have until now been very happy with the progress that we have gone. God willing, we'll go forward with this. Sure. So that's how I came out in a directory. Uh, Venkat keeps pulling my leg and it took me three months to get you into <laughs> the organization he keeps telling everyone <laughs> who he sees. So that is beside the point. But uh, once I joined and I understood the points, you know, so he's very correct in the sense that for most of the patients, if you see the, the diagnosis of cancer is not only a problem for the patient, for the family. I'm talking about an average family. It involves a lot of things, you know, they, they are losing, the, the member is losing his or her daily day livelihood because they have to take him to the hospital, undergo the treatment. Maybe it's a one-day chemotherapy, but up to 100 kilometers so you have to travel 100 kilometers. Then that is like two to three days of livelihood gone for the patient and for the uh, relative or companies, plus the family job back in the native place is there. So sure. instead you bring the center and most of the cancers, 90% of the treatment can take place in a routine hospital. It's only that 10% which requires complicated treatments per se. So that was... Uh, the thing you know without borders and our partner hospitals are all in tier two tier three cities or towns i would say where they have a routine of a small hospital facilities and we are doing a cancer treatment there and we have a good command center which is all india works 24 7 and they guide these patients towards whichever center if at all they require a complicated treatment so that's in a nutshell about carcinos per se i would say sure. but yeah thank you for giving the opportunity okay. for them Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So as uh, Dr. Shed, you know, this is such a unique concept. And when I also heard it for the first time, I was uh, initially just curious because I think all of us have had uh, the family members or loved ones, you know, going through cancer or something. But this, I think from a vision standpoint, it's huge. Probably the only organization which is working in the space to not just build awareness, but also make healthcare accessible at relatively affordable costs. And the overall approach that we have also to say that, you know, how do we become proactive about health and something like cancer as against being reactive, which we usually are, that only when it happens, then we realize. 
And uh, so over to you, doctor. And of course, I think some questions are already coming and I can see them, but okay. let's hear him out because there'll be some things which he'll probably already cover. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we'll have a dedicated uh, section for q &A. Uh, Over to you. Uh, can I share the screen? Yes, can yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, are you able to? Uh, just let me see. No, it still says disabled. Uh, if you could make okay, the just check that. Otherwise, we'll bring it up from here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have been made course. Thank you. So. Yeah. I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, doctor, we can see yeah. that. So, but you said the focus is on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, the, the when the great places to work came to us, we put on this thing, you know, proactive approach to cancer prevention. Many of us have a, I mean, many of us, even in, I would say, in the medical profession, do not realize that there is a most of the common cancers, you know, this is not just for India, but out of India also is preventable and if detected earlier can be cured you know many have don't still don't realize that you know still has that stigma attached to that you know it's a death sentence yeah it's not curable so cancer prevention and screening are two important aspects it is not very glamorous thing to talk about that like saying i was high-end machines or the high-end surgical or uh, stem cell transplant and others, but it is a very, very important thing and which is unfortunately not many people realize that. So let's put go there. So, yeah. so I'll just start with a few numbers. So in 2020, we had nearly in India, we had around 13 lakh new cancer patients. This is what is registered many times. The unregistered is expected to be another 50% to this. So that is approximately many times the cancer registries do not even exist in uh, many of the states in India. So in 2020, when we I first started using the statistics for this uh, PowerPoint, when I was searching out, one in 10 Indians was said that there's a chance that they will develop cancer during their lifetime. So 10% of us will develop the cancer. But in 2022 and by 2023, January, actually, the number has increased to one in eight. And by this year, and probably the WHO estimates that one in sorry, one in seven will be the uh, chance of an Indian having a cancer during his or her lifetime. The major issue is not that, it is that ki our survivals are very poor even now. But agar ap, uh, European or if you see the US and other areas, it's less than 30% as compared to them. In UK, for early stage cancers and most of the common cancers, they have a rate of cure rate of more than 90%. So it's something like uh, tuberculosis cure rate, which we are talking about here, you know, more than 90%. Some of them having more than 95% cure rate. We have a long way to go there, but yeah, we have to be there in many ways. So the importance of early detection. So two things, as I said, prevention and screening for cancer is a very important thing. The importance is that most of the cancers in India are diagnosed at an advanced stage and it requires complicated treatments, you know, uh, complicated chemotherapy protocols, high-dose chemotherapies, complicated surgeries, radiations, high-end radiation machines. If, you, if one can detect it earlier, treatment is that much simpler and that much less toxic and that much less cumbersome, you know, it, and the person is that much more active more quickly. So the it's not just from an economic point of view, from a person's own well-being and a quality of life point of view, it becomes much more easier to treat if one detects it earlier. So this is a very simple slide showing a, what is a cancer risk factor and what are the things. So modifiable is which we can control, you know, non modifiable something we have no control over. You, uh, if you are a female, you have a higher risk of breast cancer. Males have a higher risk of uh, prostate cancer. These are because we have those organs and they are more common. Otherwise, these things are not there. So, but in 90 to 95 percent of cases, that's vast majority of situations, we have modifiable factors. Most common two being tobacco and alcohol use to a lesser extent, 
physical inactivity and dietary factors. These three are the commonest things. Of course, others like lack of breastfeeding. Those are not very common in India. Occupational carcinogen sedation, again, are not very common. The vast majority which we see on a daily basis are either tobacco or alcohol use, predominantly tobacco. In India, we have a very heavy tobacco base, which uh, causes most of the malignancies in Indian situation. So in a simple manner, what can we do to this thing? One, of course, is the one thing which any oncologist for the Avoid tobacco in any form that is there. That is either chewing, chewing tobacco or smoking BD or as a hookah, whichever way you want, and cut down alcohol consumption. Uh, so, alcohol is as as it is. It's not there's not a need to stop, but you need to cut down considerably. But completely avoid tobacco. Tobacco even in smaller uh, doses are still carcinogenic. That has become a major issue. One thing we have to remember is if tobacco was not discovered 300 years back and it had come in 1950s or 60s, it would never have come into the market itself. So there, there are chemicals which have been banned, which are much less toxic than tobacco. And yet, um, much less when I mean it is not even 10% of the toxicity of tobacco is there. And yet we continue to have tobacco in the market, but it has been there traditionally, so it remains. The uh, second thing is avoid energy dense and avoid sugary foods. These are again to reduce, I would not say avoid is more stronger words, reduce out and take meals in divided portions and have more of unprocessed and less of processed. You know, as I say, have more atta and less maida in your foods. For women, especially more important is a monthly breast self-examination and anybody above 40 years should have an annual mammogram. Pap smear or HPV testing has also a role. This I'll be coming to in the later slides. So one thing which many people ask, especially when their relatives or others come to me, is kya kaya, kya na kaya. Generally, I would not say kya uh, sab kuch band karo. As much as possible, have unprocessed food. You know, just say, our ancestors like what our ancestors used to have. That is, you know, unprocessed food. They say, just I said now, having atta, brown bread, vegetables, fruits as much less as processed as possible. If you are non-vegetarian, have fish, uh, chicken, fresh. These are good, uh, this thing. And you can cut down on uh, processed meat, red meat, sugary drinks, and high calorie food. The, the cut down that is red meat or sugary drinks and high calorie. These are actually you know meant for celebrations. This should be taken sparingly, uh, occasionally, when the occasion demands it, I would say. So uh, not on a daily basis. So I would not say stop any of these foods, but up, usko we should balance up. Daily should be what is coming on the upper part, you know, vegetables, fruits with healthy protein foods and whole grain foods and less number of sugary and other foods. You know, we need to have it in moderation. Nature never has free sugars or free salt or free fats available. It's always in some bounded form or anything. So only our processing which makes these free sugars and free salts available. So it's meant we cannot overcome evolution. We have had these things only for the past 100 years. So we should have this in moderation. So this is, I, I think many of us would have seen it. It's a very boring slide showing what are the things in a cigarette. These are much more than that. More than close to 4,000 chemicals are known to be in cigarettes. Common things I have mentioned out here. In addition to this, there is also polonium, some degree of plutonium, all of radioactive materials are also there. Funnily enough, nicotine is not much of a health. It has no health benefit. Nicotine is not a major health risk. Maybe some studies have shown some degree of health risk with nicotine. But the problem is nicotine is the addictive factor in cigarettes. So um, the, the what we inhale, unfortunately, is not uh, the tobacco and nicotine alone. The other things which come as a part of the burning process and as a part of the combination processes, what is uh, affecting our health. So uh, one thing which I think all of us have to realize is, you know, quitting smoking by a smoker is, it's a bit difficult thing. We have to support them, you know. Somebody is trying to quit. It is very difficult. It's a very painful process. Somebody who has smoked has to undergo uh, when he or she quits and uh, we should, support them you know, in workplace, in family, and as uh, friends and others to support them because that is very much required. 
And unfortunately, multiple and repeated studies have shown that the only way which is successful in quitting smoking is to quit what is known as cold turkey. Matlab, stop it suddenly. No? Ek dam se band kar. One day you realize, stop say, from today I will not smoke. So that is the most successful method to stop smoking. It's a very difficult method, but uh, it is feasible. So uh, one thing to, to always believe in that that there is an effort required because nicotine is a physical and a psychological dependency. It produces both. Body does get used to nicotine being there in the system and initial period is very difficult. But it is the initial periods which are difficult and later on it becomes more easier. But it will take time. There will be periods in one's life when one may wish to go back to the tobacco. You know? So, But uh, believe in your ability to quit and first and most important thing I always tell to anybody who wants to quit is first that the first step is that you have taken that, you know, that you realize that you need to make an effort to quit. That is the first realization that should come from the smoker. Second is his own belief and confidence that yes, I can quit. Once you decide it, try to avoid being with smokers or tobacco chewers because the smell and the, 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 the color, it brings back memory and the body's need for that, you know. If necessary, you, there are tobacco cessation clinics and always involve the family and friends and the work environment. I, I think as a, you know, working, one of the major things that work can provide is a stimulation and it help to avoid uh, using uh, tobacco and other things, you know, and your guidance to provide a, a worker or an employee to quit smoking. Nicotine chewing gums and... Nicotine chewing gums and e-cigarettes have come about. E-cigarettes are much of a problem. Fortunately, the Indian government has already banned it. So there's nothing much to talk about it. it it's not that beneficial as compared to uh, some benefits are there, but overall it is bad. It can have its own set of issues. And uh, long term, it's believed that the eventual these things might be the same. In fact, most of the countries have banned it now outright or have heavily regulated it somewhat like that of a um, uh, simple cigarette. So nicotine chewing gums are available to help people to quit. So e-cigarette, uh, I would like to make very clear, is not a method to quit tobacco. That is very specifically, I have put it here because people have asked me, can we use e-cigarettes to quit uh, as a start to quit smoking? E-cigarette is not a method. Nicotine chewing gum and nicotine patches are to some extent, but uh, they have, nicotine does have some harmful effect. So uh, do not hope. Please do not use an e-cigarette as a method to, you know, to stop uh, smoking or as a uh, feasibility for you to start stop smoking. It is not, and it has its own set of side effects. And don't even think about using it as a method to, to you stop smoking. You know? It's just like uh, starting good car to stop uh, cigarette smoking. So same set of side of side effects, same problems. So. Uh, what I would like to ask some of us, like please just, you know, what do you uh, as a person, you know, many, many times I ask, you know, people when I give talks and others, you know, cancer ke bare mein sunte ho, when you hear the word, you know, what are the things that you think about it? So uh, um, as a doctor, when I first decided to take up, uh, uh, you know, to go into oncology, many of my, I would be very frank, many of my family itself was very, um, teachers and family were really, uh, confused as why I would want to go into oncology of all medical specialties. You know, it was a very big question from them. Hey, why do you want to go? So I would like to know what, if at all, if any of you have anything to contribute, you know. So meanwhile, I'm putting this slide up there. You know, this was a thing which was done by the Indian Cancer Society some years back, five to six years back, you know, uh, asking people, you know, what they thought when they uh, the, the, the thought about cancer. You know, many of the myths of cancer, you know, and many of the problems which is associated with the cancer diagnosis is present in this entire study. So uh, one and most common thing, you know, which I've heard from most of the patients which come with very advanced or some problem is that they knew that there was something growing, but they thought that it was not curable and I didn't want to burden the family. And uh, uh, as much as possible, I thought okay, if I ignore it, the problem will go away, you know. Um, uh, but ignorance uh, is very dangerous as far as cancer goes. So the first and foremost thing everybody had was a very fearfulness, you know, and they were hoping that the thing that, that was growing was not cancer. 
so uh, as much as possible need not know about it and let it be that way so that was one thing second thing is you know keep people don't want to talk about it they are worried that if they talk about uh, they, if they talk about cancer they may end up having cancer that is a big problem for them so uh, i have had patients tell me the same thing you know if agar cancer ke bare mein baat karte hain hame cancer aa jayega that's a belief that they have if you talk too much about cancer you may end up getting cancer you know? so, so it's a forbidden word in he tisa cheez hai ki you know everybody um, doesn't want to think that nothing bad will happen to them but when you cross a road you don't think you will get hit but somebody gets hit somebody will always get that you know so uh, it will not happen to us wo nahi hai it is not that easy to say Ca cancer has a very complex uh, set of causative factors it is not like you know one set ek hi factor hai, like covid ka covid ka covid ka covid virus cause karte hai uh, cancer is not like one cause it is multiple causes happening over time and space which will eventually lead to cancer at some point in somebody's life so no one can predict even i cannot predict whether i will have cancer despite all the knowledge that so many teachers and others have taught me there is again i can tell you very frankly that i cannot predict and whether i will have cancer or any of my family members will have or not any of my family members have some of them i have only treated so that is there uh, theme thing is uh, ignore some symptoms so most of us tend to have a tendency to ignore minor symptoms even if uh, if it is not uh, going away second thing is not many people realize ki at screening you know even if government keeps it some organization comes and says ki कैंप्स लगाते हैं कि आ जाओ स्क्रीन करते हैं तो दैट इट्स नॉट ऑफ मच यूज स्क्रीनिंग इज अ वेरी इफेक्टिव एज आई सेड बिफोर यू नो डिटेक्टिंग अर्लीयर एंड आल्सो गेटिंग अ सिंपलर ट्रीटमेंट एंड अ मोर लेस ट्रीटमेंट यू नो लेस टू द पेशेंट नॉट ओनली इन इकोनॉमिक टर्म्स बट इन अ क्वालिटी ऑफ लाइफ मेथड एंड इन अ लेस इन अ टाइम ड्यूरेशन वे एंड मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंटली कैंसर ट्रीटमेंट इज मेनी टाइम्स एक्सपेंसिव बट screening is not so that is a very very important thing screening is not at all a costly and occasional screening methods are slightly inconvenient but, but per se most of them are straight forward method you know doing it as a camp or as a as in a workplace area you know it it makes somebody as a part of a team who is undergoing screening and it gives them more enthusiasm to participate in a screening rather than a single individual going for uh, screening per se so even in very highly developed countries like in scandinavia they do screening as a as a community activity you know so it's not that a uh, single individual goes to don't know the government or the organization encourage them to come as a as a community effort and so they select a village on a particular day that we will come and do screening here and they encourage everybody to come there they make it kind of a festive kind of a thing so people come participate and make have positive associations with uh, screening so uh in my opinion of course keep as much as screening is separated from the hospital that much the great it is screening should always be a community effort a workplace effort and a community effort you know it has, should not be a part of a hospital that it can be in the hospital also but as much as possible it should be not a part of a hospital also so let's see just few of the commonest not all of them just a few of the commonest cancers we'll just go quickly go through that because some of these are very highly preventable so uh, one of the first myths which i have ever always faced is you know a cancer has no cure and it's not preventable so I'll, there are some cancers which has no known risk factors but these are the rarer cancers so 95% of cancers are preventable and are screenable and can be detected at a early stage both are that it's preventable and screenable and this is true world over and this is true in india also so that we have to be very clear cut and known about it oral cancer is coming down now especially in uh, middle class and upper middle class you know higher socio economic groups but in the lower socio economic group it remains still because tobacco chewing unfortunately is a very common and uh, use of tobacco remains a common alcohol with tobacco has a multiplicative effect it just don't add to the risk it multiplies the risk of having oral and head and neck cancers so india is called as the biggest head and neck cancer center in the world so india has the largest number of uh, head and neck cancers many of our major cancer centers have multiple units of head and neck cancer departments whereas all other cancer departments single units 
and in india also the most common cancer is oral or head and neck cancer so these are two some not something to be proud about but these are facts which remain so the oral cancers what one of the major things which i have always felt is it's very easy to see because something the patient can see with the relatives can see har din we uh, go in the morning look in the mirror uh, shave karte daant and mouth saaf karte you know we brush our teeth clean our mouth so we can see it in the mirror very easily most of the uh, head and neck cancers are in visible areas so the most common thing which comes up is in white or a red or a mixed colored patch which doesn't go away so just because you have a reddish color or whitish color doesn't mean that there's cancer but koi bhi anything that is more than 3 weeks you are looking at a possibility of cancer and need evaluation at least i'm not saying it's cancer you need evaluation something doesn't go away in your oral cavity a color difference or a small wound or something it doesn't go away you have to see a doctor your closest family doctor not a normal is not necessary doctor go and see a close by doctor any other thing so swelling in the neck or a pain in the mouth or a tongue or jaw pain any difficulty in chewing etc these are all to go to a doctor but most important please remember a red or a white or any change in your visible area of the mouth or any difficulty in eating please meet a doctor so one more thing which i would like to suggest many times is you know once in a month do check your mouth so uh, when you are brushing your teeth you know just pull up your upper lips and see mirror me kya hai pull down your lower lip see the gums open the mouth and see the palate and other areas feel your tongue with your hands and how it is any change in your this because we know our bodies our own body is much better than any of the other areas you know just just do it once a month very easy to pick up so uh, it's known as a eight step method by who and others but it's a very common easy method once in a month koi bhi ek try to choose kar lo maybe if the first of every month then do it the second most common cancer is lung cancer so uh, the lung cancer major issue nowadays in india is the increase in number of female lung cancers now the the, the as a country india the use of smoking cigarettes is not very common among uh, females in ladies but we have a large number of female patients mainly because of the uh, the phenomenon of second hand smoking or uh, the environmental smoking so the spouse smokes in the room or in the bedroom or in the kitchen or somewhere and the family members are inhaling that smoke so the the risk is almost 80% of that of a direct smoker if you are in the same room as a smoker that's why we have all those in airports and other areas you can have different smoking sections itself you know where smoke the, that room which has completely shut off from elsewhere that is because of the to avoid a second hand smoke that's why the government has now very strict laws to prevent smoking in workplaces and if you see all our 60s and 70s movies you know you can see the hero and others sitting there in the uh, office smoking and doing that you go to office today you not see anybody smoking i mean uh, if at all somebody has to go out and smoke even that is prevented in many areas in india so uh, unfortunately for lung cancer most of the symptoms are very non specific you know you might have a cough occasional many of the smokers already have cough because of smoking related cough sometimes there may be slight difficulty in breathing or any uh, things may be there sometimes um, feeling of tiredness may be there any blood in sputum or any other more specific symptoms comes up it is time to check up but do have a look you know how much uh, difficulties you have with smoking anything more do go for a uh, this uh, check up prostate cancer is more a disease of the elderly but its numbers are there it is many a times under detected i have put it up although it is not still a very not a that common a cancer probably we are not detecting most of them one of the reasons of putting it up in this presentation is that we have a simple blood test in most labs around the country you know, most labs are doing it now you get it within around 2 to 3 hours the report is get to it's known as a psa test not very expensive and if it is markedly high for your age you have to have an evaluation for prostate cancer so it's a very simple straight forward screen test for prostate cancer this is especially for all our male uh, persons who are sitting there you know it's a very simple you don't have to do it in your younger age but anybody above 40 years once a year a psa there is no recommendation per se from any society regarding how frequently one should do a psa but I, if somebody asks me i say ab saal mein ek bar kar le it's not an expensive test and if you find anything you go ahead and treat it so uh, less than 40 is not very essential but above 40 is you can see i would not say 
because there is no guidelines per se on testing, but it's not an expensive test. And nowadays you get it on almost any lab, you can find this out. So an interesting factor, which is, which I have noticed over a period of years is colon cancer. You know, when in my training period or in my younger days, we didn't have much patients. We had patients, of course, with colon cancer, that is large intestinal cancer. But it was not very common, you know, it was a much less common thing. We had more of esophageal and other cancers, but nowadays colon is very large. It is like third or fourth commonest cancer now and still increasing in a uh, rapid manner. Colon is, again, one is of course smoking. You can ask how smoking causes large intestinal cancer. Because when you inhale the smoke, it goes not only into our airways, but it goes through the foot pipe into the stomach and eventually into the large intestine. So alcohol is again one more culprit here. It has a product uh, multiplicative effect here also. Colon is one of those things where uh, our dietary habits are very important. So again, as I mentioned before, you know, use of processed foods, red meat, excess consumption. These are one of the major risk factors for colon cancer. Using unprocessed fiber-rich food is one of the direct methods of reducing colon cancer risk. Colon cancer risk is very uncommon in uh, vegetarians as compared to non-vegetarians. I'm not saying one should be a vegetarian or a, uh, should stop using non-vegetarian, but use it in everything in moderation. And avoid processed uh, this thing as much less as well. Occasional eating is fine. Again, uh, most common symptom of colon cancer is blood or mucus. But that said, one thing to remember is most common cause of blood or mucus in stool is actually uh, hemorrhoids or your piles kete wo hai. and but at the same time many patients with colon cancer have come to me because they have missed uh, diagnosing it thinking that the blood and mucus in the stool which they were having was due to hemorrhoids so anytime you have blood or mucus for the first time do meet a doctor and if you have already a patient with hemorrhoids or pile if your bleeding changes or the color changes or it increases or kuch aur farak aapke bowel habits mein ho rahe, then again meet a doctor so, till recently, the commonest screen test used even now is what is known as a stool testing. So, we had stool occult blood testing. But the problem with that was if you had animal blood which you had taken, sometimes it gave false positive results. So, now we have uh, even a simple. And second thing was that, that this was done only in a lab at required chemicals and other things. So, you had to go to the person, had to go to the lab, get the bottle for testing. Next day morning, stool sample, lake it. They had to go and give it back. Now the newer technology has come in and we have what is known as a FIT test, FIT test. This can be done in the house with a small stool sample which you collect and you just, the entire thing is written on it. And you read it the way we read a COVID test or a pregnancy test. And if there are two bands, it's positive. And this is very specific for human blood. So if it is there, you know that it is human blood, you need further evaluation. And it's very common, it's not a expensive test. It's a cost of both are more or less, I think 10 rupees per difference here, don't know is fine. So uh, we come to one of the most common cancers in India, especially in women, that is breast cancers. So um, again, until about the 90s, breast cancer was not that very common. It was more gradually towards the end of 90s, it became more common in cities. It, breast cancer was always known as cancer of Western countries, European or US. Maybe. That it was a commonest by a large margin. In India, as I said before, till mid to late 90s, it was only commonest by the time in major metros, especially Bombay and Delhi. Most of the other cities and in villages and elsewhere, cervical was the major cancer and breast was much less. It has been a very well-defined studies are there which have shown that as the socioeconomic status of a country goes up, you know, as a country becomes more and more developed and the economic situation of a country increases, the breast cancer in incidence increases. The reason for that is the lifestyle of the persons that change. So this is something which was there true in US and in Europe. It is also true in India also. So as of today, that is in by around 2010s, breast cancer had become the most common cancer in women across India. I mean, remotest part of India to the metros, there was no change any further. That was the most common cancer. Breast cancer, again, like previously, as I mentioned, like the oral cancer, one of the most uh, important things about that, it is something which is uh, visible and feelable, you know. So any swelling or any nipple discharge which one has, it requires evaluation. 
most of the time a swelling or a nipple discharge is not due to cancer but don't think about it in that way get it evaluated by a doctor so that you know for sure that what it is due to any slightly more symptoms you know like having a nipple retraction or a change in skin color or a skin irritation you have to have definitive with this thing. something which is very useful which many of our um, uh, ladies do not uh, know uh, women doesn't realize is what is known as a breast self examination now in a woman who has not attained menopause a breast self examination is ideally done on the 9th to 11th day of starting of period this is because the breast is more soft and supple during that period and the breast is best examined in that time uh, so if you are pre menopausal that is you are not attend your menopause please to the see your date of starting of periods and on the bit anywhere between 9th to 11th day do this for all others who have attained menopause just pick any date of the month say every 15th so every 15th in of months of january 15th february 15th march 15th you do a breast self this can be done simply during a, uh, when you are taking a bath or any other time stand in front of a mirror look at both the breasts look for any change in the color or a shape or a size or anything of that sort second is raise your hand again look into both of your axillas you know your arm folds and into the breast this raising of hand is important one is to see the armpits and second is to look some of the smaller swellings which may hide under a muscle will come out more prominently when you raise your hand above the head uh, slightly lay back and you can use the palmar aspect not the tip of your first three fingers but the inner aspect of your first three fingers and check for any swelling or any irregularity in both your breasts you now compare one breast to the other and see for that also look out for any nipple secretions and finally don't forget to check your armpits so <clears throat> it's a very simple two minute thing once in a month and it is very useful uh, to detect any small abnormalities most of the time again many of the abnormalities detected may not be cancer at all but it provides a very simple straightforward method for an early detection very early detection of uh, breast cancer the patient is a person who knows their breast and their structure it much better than even an oncologist i have had patients come to me you know, where even i had difficulty sometimes discerning out the the small swelling with the person had picked up you know uh, i have really wondered how she managed to pick that small thing out from the whole even mammograph sometimes doesn't show that you know and the, the person had picked it out and was very specific that it was abnormal and so we could evaluate and find it out in very early stage so second thing is of course i'm not going to the testing the mammogram is something which we have to do once a year if you are above the age of 40 that is the who guidelines if possible kindly do a mammogram above the age of 40 up till the age of 70 so this is about breast examination and breast self exam that is the most important thing i would say if feasible kindly consider doing a mammogram from a nearby mammogram center now it has become much more common in india to do a mammogram so do it from any of the mammogram centers nearer to your house once in a year if you are above age 40 and less than age 70 if you have any high risk features which you can discuss with your doctor they may require more frequent india as of today second most common is cervical this is very important also because the cancer this is becoming a preventable cancer just like we have prevented you know smallpox it is now who's in estimation that we can prevent cervical cancer the two important things one the we the most of cervical cancer you know more than 99% is caused by a virus known as the you know, human papilloma virus or for short form hpv so Uh, the 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 hpv the, the the important thing is that we have a vaccine since around 2010 11 has been available for uh, vaccination against hpv but it has remained a very expensive vaccine uh, made outside of the country and was not available inside uh, this year i mean actually in december 2022 the indian uh, marketer i mean manufacturer has brought out an the an hpv vaccine which has been approved by who and by the government and as i speak this most probably in another one or two months the government of india is most likely to include this vaccine into the universal immunization programs you know so once we are able to give uh, to 90% of the girls under the age of 15 this vaccination we can more or less prevent cervical cancer so for all of us who have uh, have not got the vaccine most important thing remains to get the screening 
most important screening is for HPV. As per WHO, now for cervical cancer, women have to get screened for HPV. For some reason, HPV testing is not available. Our old pap smear, which is the most simple test, is also available almost everywhere in India. HPV uh, was expensive, very expensive previously. But with you know, with improvements in technology, the cost of everything comes down. So HPV testing has also cost has also come down very much. So there are other many other cancers, but these are the most common cancers, which as I've talked about. And there are much treatments. I'm not going much into that. There are complicated treatments like transplants and other things. There is nothing need to go for that. So what I would like to reiterate, you know, before I go on towards the end of my talk, is that early detection is the most important one, not only in terms of cost, but in terms of life, quality of life, duration of treatment, and fitness of the patient. And I would say from an Indian perspective, fitness and survival of the family also, because uh, it is not just one individual who gets disease when he has cancer, it's the entire family who's going to suffer from uh, cancer. So earlier something is detected, earlier it is diagnosed and earlier it becomes uh, much more treatable. So the, not only a direct cause, but indirect costs are also very important. So at Carcinos, we have been trying to tie up with different centers as our partners, in addition to having our own multiple centers. Not only in India, but now outside India also, it is going up Dubai and US, it's coming up. We have set of labs also for many of the higher tests, which are not available in India at all. So now these tests are also coming, have come up actually in some parts like in Bombay and Kochi, but are also coming up in another two, three weeks in uh, Guwahati and in Chennai and in uh, Hyderabad. So uh, as a, uh, the other thing which I have noticed, you know, is organizations, work organizations have started playing a very important role, in, not only in cancer, in general in wealth and health of the patients also. So one of the things is, of course, having awareness sessions like which I am giving. Second is risk assessment of uh, by the organization of their own employees. There are well-defined risk assessment, just things which a person can tick and send back, which will uh, let them know whether they are high risk or not. And those who are high risk need to come for screening only. If some, someone is of a certain age and wishes to go for screening, fine and good. Second, of course, is make available the corresponding doctor. One more thing which uh, over a period of time, which just noticed out, you know, is that the organizations, you know, I'm not talking about big organizations. I'm really talking about smaller organizations, you know, like, uh, two, three smaller hotels or restaurants have started supporting their caregivers, you know, in the sense that when you treat somebody with cancer, the entire focus of the treatment team, the family, the others, and uh, everything is on to the patient. What one forgets is the caregiver who is there, the primary caregiver, it can be usually the spouse or the child, the children or the parent, whom we forget, you know, they are undergoing a lot of physical and emotional stress, not just financial, also there. They have to go for their work and come for uh, treatment of their of the loved ones. And they also have a guilty feeling in them that they are not doing enough or, uh, you know, 24 hours is not enough for them. They somehow wants to be there always, but work and other things don't allow it. So many problems have there. So, in the earlier days, you know, most of the organizations were not very this thing. You know, uh, your relative has a cancer. Why do you want to waste time with it? Uh, send him to a nursing home and let them give him end of life care and treatment. Why do you want to take leave for the thing? So from that to a situation now where even smaller organizations are saying on the day of treatment, like for taking chemotherapy, for example, since I'm a medical oncologist, so they do. They say you take leave and go. We'll pay you on that. No need to take. Oh, uh, non-paying leave, we'll give you a paid leave itself. You go take it, come the next day for the, any complications occur, you go on leave, uh, go and uh, get the treatment for it. Not only that, uh, smaller organizations, uh, one is of course ESI is already available. Other important thing is the the other people who are working there, they're pitching, they provide support in terms of finance as an emotional support to them. I have had, you know, uh, the, uh, the other colleagues of an employee come in uh for as a relative for a uh, for some days because uh, the primary caregiver was not well because the cancer treatment sometimes takes time so this is a very important and it's a very positive change from it started with the bigger organizations but uh, i'm very happy to say that even smaller organizations are nowadays doing the same 
in, in the way which is feasible for them. And, you know, bigger organizations already have their own insurances and others, but smaller organizations have also. And to some extent, they are also trying to remove that stigma and trying to get their employees to come for awareness sessions and others. Civil society, again, the same. Panchayats and others have become more proactive now. NGOs have also come in to do risk assessment and uh, referral for screening and others. With this, I would like to end my talk. We have a command center which you can call anytime and talk about cancer. It's not only meant for patients. It is also meant for anyone, any citizen of India who wishes to talk or uh, wants their concerns such as for cancer. Before I end, I would like to thank again great places to work for this meeting and this opportunity for me to talk. So back to you, Prithva. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arthakrishnan. Uh, that was definitely very useful. Uh, so many things uh, that, you know, we don't know about or, uh, you know, uh, think or have myths about. I think uh, your presentation clarified uh, that for us. We could, we could actually take off the presentation and we'll just open it for questions. Yeah. There are a couple of questions uh, already and uh, feel free to add in uh, any more questions. So, uh, uh, one of our attendees, and I know you put it up right, uh, uh, right up front as a question, Kesha. So thank you for waiting. And uh, this gentleman is sharing that uh, they have an infrastructure company where uh, the project sites have a lot of, uh, you know, dust and dirt and other things which could be present in the air. So what is the best way to? One of course, uh, I think they've asked is what, how, what is the best way to make a employees aware about cancer, which could be done through talks like this, and maybe with some written material. But is there anything on the prevention front, in, you know, uh, you suggest, uh, doctor, especially where we know that, uh, and here this person has mentioned about an infrastructure site, but it could be other uh, work environments also, which sometimes could uh, have higher risk. So uh, one thing is, there are very uh, very specific guidelines, you know, how a site should be and what are the um, uh, workers should wear. So sometimes it's not feasible or practical because it just many times is not affordable to the uh, the person concerned to have a uh, mask or other things. A simple mask, which now everybody is used to it because of COVID, I would say, mm. considerably cuts down the amount of uh, uh, the amount of inhaled dust and particles which the worker is inhaling. So uh, direct inhalation is not there in many of the you know, that, that kind of work because it's on very specific filter mask. But in general, a construction site, all that is required for most of the site is along with the general safety features, you know, a straightforward mask, you know, a simple mask, which is uh, very fortunately, I would say because of COVID, uh, that word should not be used, but is not available at a very low cost. You know, it's something which organizations can make available to them. And it reduces it considerably. There are huge studies which show that the amount of particulate matter inhaled in, with and without a mask becomes a huge deficit. COVID as a virus was a very infective virus, but a simple mask was very effective in preventing it Preventive. from being transmitted. So, your dust and other things are much larger particles, you know, it's not sub-microscopic, so it will become very useful. So that is one thing I would like to say, so that is enough, you know, along with having, you know, the usual safety features, have a mask, uh, encourage them to wear a mask. You, they can reuse it, you know, unlike COVID, it need not be thrown away. They can mm -hmm. use it for three, four days or use a cloth mask. So use two masks, one you can wash and use. Other times, the other one can be used. And it's not very expensive. And it's like, I think many companies will be able to provide it at a very low cost, you know, two rupees, teen rupees, maybe ajate mas. That is one thing. The other question which he had raised was very specifically great um, stage three cancers. Now, right. one thing which I will mention here is you know, every cancer is very different in the sense that a breast cancer is very different from a prostate cancer or which is very different from a oral cancer. So uh, stage three, if I could know what cancer it was, then it makes a huge difference. So I, unfortunately, he has not mentioned which cancer it is. You know, stage three cancer is what he has said. So if he wants, if, if he could just give me the information of which cancer it was, which he's talking about, you know, stage three head and neck cancer or stage three colon or stage three breast. So it differs uh, based on what type it is. You know, the stage three 
which site cancer it is. So uh, that he has not mentioned. If I could know that or anytime he can contact us, I can talk with that's not an issue. Yeah, so I hope you got that. I mean, obviously, uh, he need more details, but uh, the fact is that they are accessible. So you could uh, definitely connect separately right. also. Uh, also, I saw one other gentleman, you had your hand raised. Now, I don't know, is that, if, would you like to ask a question, Weber, or uh, was it just raised by chance? Because I can't read your question. If you would li like to ask. Okay, it's gone. All right. Okay, okay. Any any other questions uh, that the audience have here? I know I have a few from the ones that uh, you had shared earlier and I could go to that, but I thought uh, for the people who are here, of course, do also share your feedback in terms of what would you like us to share more of yeah, and we will do that, yeah. So I think uh, Divya would have already said one more thing, you know, that, that uh, the, the risk format can be easily acted. It's really available online. The mm. risk training, uh, Joe have, you know, employees can just fill it and uh, submit right, it. Right, 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 right. Yeah, Divya that... would have a talk on, I mean, you give some information on that, but it's very simple to fill out. It takes two to three minutes and um, you yes, can just yes. fill it in ways. In fact, I would love to share that. Yeah, it's it's a non-invasive test. So yeah, I take exactly. that because exactly. I exactly. wanted to suggest for the people to know it's it's more of a behavioral and habits and observing some of the things like the doctor shared. So they have a test which you know you can take it online. It's just a it's a digital, it's a questionnaire basically, and basis what you answer, the uh, uh, the risk. Uh, likelihood, right? Whether you're high risk, low risk, whatever, there are some uh, recommendations that you get, and that assessment is available uh, by CARC, you know, So anybody who's interested can be done, uh, can take it. And of course, there are organizations who, as a part of the preventive approach, have incorporated this in their annual uh, checkups. So, so that is something which is uh, definitely uh, available. Now, if I look at some of the questions that we had got, doctor, even while, you know, when people signed up, they had shared. So maybe I can take one or two before okay. I understand that uh, from a time standpoint. So one was, uh, I think some you have covered, but specifically when we talk about, you know, lifestyle changes and you did mention about, um, you know, some of the food, uh, exercise, etc. Is there, uh, what should I say, something like a must do and easy that, everybody can adopt would there be like any set of tips that you would like to tell uh which you feel that everybody can adopt which is so other than what i would say other than tobacco cessation mm -hmm. there's really nothing much you know i i i what i point out to almost all my patients is in from an oncology point of view to a large extent our ancestors had it right you know our mm -hmm. grandparents and their grandparents had it right you know that's what they were eating in right. terms of what they were doing and eating was correct in that sense, you know, other than many of them use tobacco, the, the, the rest of the dietary pattern was very correct. Over a period of time, uh, uh, we have lost that. So, uh, you know, the, the processing of food, uh, you know, that the use of a processed food and red meat, you know, to re a reduction in that would help us to bring down considerably most of the cancers in GI tract and prostate, etc. So the, the the there is no one specific diet or one specific food, you know, which will help you. Prevent it. it is just a normal diet which we have and with less yeah. of processed food. As I said before, you know, those foods, you know, like a burger or a pizza, it's meant for a celebration or an occasion. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. so uh, it's not, when you are young, it is different. When you are, say, in schools or colleges, you know, it is a different thing, you know, but once you cross a certain age, you know, your body is no longer that. So uh, that said, you know, one thing I would like to point out here is our youngsters are much better than I would say. You know, nowadays, I don't see much youngsters using uh, cigarettes. Right? Most of them are more into gyms and other things. Uh, I think that is a very welcome change. I see many of our younger generation, you know. But in general, as a food, what I would say is use unprocessed food as much as possible. Avoid polished rice, avoid uh, or reduce polished rice, reduce maida, use atta and have normal diet, which we were all having before. Occasionally, you have any of the things you want to have, um, uh, fast foods or colas or whatever you would have it, but make it an occasion and maybe that it not be much of a problem. None of these need to be stopped. It is not that you need to have only a, you know, kind of a very rigid diet. You know, just have a normal diet, have enjoy your life, be practical and 
keep the celebrations for occasions. And so that is a way to, I think, would be a more practical way of going forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And maybe I'll take the last uh, question, which has just come in and uh, we're towards the end of time, which is uh, the person is asking that, you know, if there is one uh, person identified on uh, colon cancer, like we said, there's any history in the family. Is there anything that people can look at from a preventive uh, standpoint? That yeah. what so colon cancer is heavily dependent on diet. So uh, the, the, there is a very small uh, genetic risk factor involved, but as a factor per se, you know, father has the son, and that is not there. So that is there are very specified families okay. around the world which is related to genetic, but that is a very small percent of uh, colon cancer. So what is known as uh, polyposis coli and HNPC. These are medical terms, but other than that, which are not the majority, the majority of colon cancers are non-familial. So most of us, sure. which we see, is not familial. So if somebody in your first degree relative has the colon cancer. First, of course, as I said, you know, check your stool. It's a very non-invasive method. Check your stool for a presence of blood. Second is get a doctor to evaluate you. If you are above 40 years, at least once undergo an endoscopy or a colonoscopy, you know, once in a decade, just to see that if possible, if that is possible. At the bare minimum, you can do a stool test and a uh, checkup by a physician. So that is what I would say. And the general diet, which we have just talked about, you know, that is a very... It becomes that much more important in prevention in cancers in colon. So that much I would say that would be the ideal situations. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. This was really useful. And uh, of course, we will be sharing uh, the recording. And if there's anything else, feel free to connect with us. Of course, uh, Doctor also shared the helpline. Uh, so feel free to connect. And uh, your feedback is always welcome for us to make these uh, sessions more meaningful for you. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, Thank you, for Thank you so much. Thank you, Preeti. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.